We want to thank today's sponsors, the Tax Defense Group and Rider Junkie. You can contact the Tax Defense Group at 800 800- 850-7973 and Rider Junkie's phone number 805-587-7966. Hi, welcome to the Talk Spot. This is Marcus, and today I'm joined by Stephen Mosher. Stephen is with the Population Research Institute. You actually founded it, right? I did back in uh, 1995, uh, working with a now deceased priest by the name of Father Paul Marx. We incorporated it. We decided it was time to tell the world that um, the world is not overpopulated, that there are plenty of resources for us. We just have to use our intellect to solve the problems that we cause by our numbers. There's no need to go around eliminating people. Well, that's a very good goal. I mean, I think a lot of people that are alive would prefer to not be eliminated. But yeah, so if, if you would mind, can you tell us a little bit about your background and the work that you've done? It goes back a long ways, but I was at Stanford University in 1979 when we opened up diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. Uh, Jimmy Carter, then president, established uh, diplomatic relations with the People's Republic on January 15th. I was the first American social scientist allowed to do research on the ground in China in 30 years, actually, since the Communist Revolution in 1949. So China had been sort of terra incognita. We didn't know much about what was happening behind what we call the bamboo curtain. And I was sent, you know, to to be uh, sort of a scout to find out what life was like after 30 years under the rule of uh, of this new political party, the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, it was a real eye-opening experience, as you can imagine. Uh, Once the local uh, Chinese people began to trust me, and they they trusted me because I can read, write, and speak Chinese, I didn't need a government interpreter. In fact, I sent my government minders away. took me weeks to get rid of them, but I finally did get rid of them. Then I was able to talk freely with the people. They were able to talk freely to me. Boy, I'll tell you, I found out a lot about human rights abuses in China after that point. I was in China when the one-child policy began. I was in China when they began arresting women for the crime of being pregnant Uh, with an illegal or over-quoted child. I was there when they were arrested. I was there when they were locked up for the crime of being pregnant without permission. I was there when they were subjected to brainwashing sessions for weeks on end. These were women who were young mothers who were six, seven, eight, nine months pregnant. And I was there when they were taken in, sometimes by force, uh, to local medical clinics where they were given forced abortions, uh, sometimes very late in pregnancy. And I'll tell you what, Marcus, if you're in the operating room, standing six feet away from an operating table where there's a, a, a young mother crying because she's eight months pregnant and they're doing a cesarean section on her to remove her baby from her body and kill it. Uh, it sort of puts uh, the whole uh, Communist Party in, in a rather different light. So in 1979, how long before that time did, had Mao passed away? Well, Mao passed away several years before. Okay. And there was a great sense of relief, I think, among the Chinese people when he left them. Because he was one of the great uh, megalomaniacs, Uh, he was one of the great dictators, he was one of the great mass murderers of the 20th century, which is known for mass murders. He ranks right up there with Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin and Pol Pot and all the rest. In fact, in terms of sheer numbers, through his political campaigns in the 50s and 60s, the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, the famine after the Great Leap Forward, which killed 42 million Chinese, they starved to death. Uh, his death toll, the death toll of people he's personally responsible for, is probably around 100 million. So we must always keep in mind that the, the first and foremost victims of the current rulers of China are the Chinese people themselves. And, you know, we, we think about now the pandemic they inflicted on the rest of the world, but they've been inflicting themselves on the Chinese people for the last 70 years. It's sad to, to, to view it up close and personal as I did. I have lots of friends in China who've suffered a great deal, some of whom are no longer alive. Hmm. As you kind of mentioned, you know, you spoke about the pandemic and the whole crisis that emerged out of China. So I guess like how great of a threat is China to the current world order? Well, I wrote a book uh, called Bully of Asia, uh, why China's dream is the new threat to world order. And China's dream, first of all, we have to understand is the dream of of Xi Jinping, current uh, leader of the Chinese Communist Party, president for head of the military commission. All roads lead to Xi. Uh, he's, he's essentially uh, got more power than anyone in China, in a leader in China since Mao Zedong. And that's not necessarily a good thing to have too much power concentrated in the hands of one man. China's dream has been, uh, China's dream, the dream 
Kim or Xi Jinping as a dream of overtaking the United States to be the dominant power on the planet. Now, if China were a democratic country that held regular free elections and the people enjoyed popular sovereignty and they had the right to uh, 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 freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, uh, they had the rights that, that, that generally we enjoy in, in, in the West, uh, that would be a good thing. Uh, the world would be a prosperous and more free place. Uh, China, unfortunately, has a very different political system in place. And what I start out by saying in the Bully of Asia is that China has had its particular kind of bureaucratic totalitarianism in place for a long, long time. It didn't start with Chairman Mao. It started 2,500 years ago with the sort of proto-totalitarianism that was found in the first Qin dynasty, the first real dynasty that we call a Chinese dynasty, the Qin dynasty, from which we get the word China. The Qin dynasty had, uh, the emperor had a secret police, he had a nationwide propaganda network, he had political commissars in the military, he had concentration camps, the inmates built the Great Wall and the Great Canals of China. He had control over arms, he had control over salt, he had control over important sectors of the economy. All the things we associate with modern Marxist-Leninism were invented in China a long, long time ago. And so when Mao Zedong uh, declared that he was a communist, he was really uh, more given to quoting uh, the ancient Chinese totalitarians called legalists than he was in quoting Marx and Lenin. China was really reverting to a very ancient form of government that it invented thousands of years ago. And that's, you know, why it is such a contrast to the rest of the world today. That's why it behaves so differently uh, than, than other countries, because it subscribes to a very different political theory. Their political theory is that just as there can only be one sun in the sky, there can only be one ruling country, there can only be one ruling emperor, and that ruling country should be China in Xi Jinping's China dream. And that ruler of all, the hegemon of the world, uh, should be Xi Jinping himself. That's the goal. They've been in a contest with us across all domains. Uh, we know they've been competing with us on trade, uh, on intellectual property. Actually, all domains except uh, the kinetic, we're not firing bullets at each other, thank goodness. But across all other domains, China has been seeking to replace us as the uh, dominant power on the planet. And now we see, I think for the first time, most of the people of the world see, because of the China virus, uh, which we can call COVID-19, we can call it the Wuhan flu, we can call it whatever you want, but let's not mistake the fact that it originated in China and was spread throughout the world by the uh, misdeeds of the Chinese Communist Party. So the last book that you wrote was called Bully of Asia. I guess what are some ways that China itself, like, I think for a lot of, for your average person that maybe just kind of, they've never even taken a political science type of course in their lives. I guess what are some ways that China, like in a practical sense, has exerted its will on the international community? And maybe if you wouldn't mind explaining how that might be different than, let's say, the way that, you know, America or European countries ha are doing it at least, you know, over the last like 20 years. I, I can give you lots of examples, Marcus. And, and, and let me say that, yeah, most Americans are happy to live their lives without worrying about threats from countries that are 5,000, 10,000 miles away. Uh, I would like to live my life that way too, but China has intruded itself upon our imagination in a way that we simply can't ignore. Most people, most of the time, you know, like they, they ordinarily we say that about 5% of Americans uh, pay attention to what's happening overseas at any given time. I would say right now that about 90% of Americans are paying attention to what's happening overseas and in China because they've been forced to. Uh, what else do we have to do when we're sheltering in place in our houses? Uh, so China has intruded itself upon our imagination, not as a positive force, but as a negative force. But it's actually been misbehaving for a long, long time. Uh, let's go back, you know, 25 years, uh, when it suddenly declared, the People's Republic of China suddenly declared that it owned uh, the entire South China Sea. Now, now, just to put this in perspective, this would be like an American uh, president suddenly declaring that the United States owns the entire Caribbean and the Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico, uh, declaring that we own uh, <laughs> Cuba and 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 Haiti and and all of the islands in 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 the Caribbean. Uh, this is a huge sea. The South China Sea has lots of islands in it, and China suddenly declared that it owned the South China Sea and said that uh, the Philippines and Brunei and Indonesia and Malaysia, Vietnam, and all the other countries 
that surrounded the South China Sea should simply withdraw and, and that they had no claim to these islands anymore, that they all suddenly belonged to China. So the Philippines said, you can't do that, China. We're going to take you to court. And so they went to the International Court, which is located in the Netherlands, in a place called The Hague, the Netherlands, and they filed a lawsuit against China for infringing on the Philippines, you know, property rights, right? Rights under the law of the sea to part of the South China Sea. And the International Court ruled in favor of the Philippines after deliberating for a couple of years and said that China was violating international law. So what did President for Life Xi Jinping, our friendly dictator from China, say in response to the decision of the International Court in The Hague? He said, the decision is toilet paper. The decision is waste paper. The decision is totally invalid and we will ignore it. So there you have a case in point of China ignoring the current international law, ignoring the international court that was set up to resolve these kinds of disputes and basically basically imposing its will on a number of smaller, weaker countries uh, that are around the South China Sea. And then we can talk about Hong Kong, where the poor Hong Kong citizens who've enjoyed, um, you know, human rights and, and economic freedom under British rule for over a century, uh, were told in 1997, when Hong Kong and its seven and a half million citizens went back to China, don't worry, citizens of Hong Kong, Kong, the Chinese have signed an agreement with the British that your current rights, your human rights, your property rights, your economic rights will stay in place for 50 years. 50 years from 1997 would be 2047. So currently the people alive in Hong Kong could live out their lives in peace without being taken under the direct rule of the Chinese Communist Party. Well, in 2017, three years ago, the Chinese Communist Party said that treaty we signed with Great Britain uh, back in uh, the 80s to preserve the current system in Hong Kong for 50 years, uh, that just has historical value. Uh, it has no, It is no longer in force. In other words, they tore up that treaty as well. I could go on, Marcus. I mean, mm. these are people who ignore uh, international law uh, when it's in their, you know, they, they abide by it when it helps them. Uh, when it doesn't help them, they simply ignore it and do what they want. Well, one thing, too, I was kind of wondering about with this whole kind of scenario is Chinese money. Like, yeah, if you wouldn't mind maybe talking a little bit about how China has influenced corporations or multinational corporations and the countries of the world through money. Like, if you wouldn't mind maybe talking a little bit about how they've used money and funding to kind of impact international politics. The Chinese Communist Party engages in in a lot of corrupt practices. All right. And, and that is true within China itself as well as the way it deals with the rest of the world. And let me give you another example. China has a president, Xi Jinping. It has a premier, the second guy, the number two guy. And the premier of China from 2002 to 2012 was Premier Li. And, 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 and uh, premier, uh, the premier actually, when the premier Li is, is Li Keqiang is premier now. The premier from uh, 2012 back 2002 was uh, when Zhao Mao. Now, Premier Wen, we don't know how much money he had when he took office, but we know that when he left office in, in 2012, on his salary of about 5,000 Chinese dollars a month, which is uh, about $1,500, uh, he had accumulated a net worth of $2.3 billion. Now, he must have made some pretty savvy investments, Marcus, to turn his pitiful salary into billions of dollars. And of course, I'm joking because what he was actually doing was he was taking bribes. If you were a colonel in the People's Liberation Army and you wanted to become a general, you paid a bribe to the premier and you would be promoted. If you had a company that you wanted a soft loan from the Chinese state bank, uh, you would pay a bribe to Premier Wen Xiaobao. That's how it worked. That's how he accumulated that much money. Uh, we talk about Russian oligarchs, you know, the, the people in Russia who control vast sectors of the economy and have become wealthy as the rest of the people remain poor. Well, there are there are a hundred times more oligarchs in China as there are in Russia. Every senior and mid-level party official in China has gotten rich because of these backroom deals, because of these under-the-table payments, because of these bribes, what they call in China red envelopes, uh, hongbao, uh, that you give officials when you want them to help you with your business. And, you know, if the party smiles on your business, you prosper in China because you get electricity, you get uh, 
uh, cheap loans from the central banks, you get the grease, you know, the, the, the skids are greased and you move right along. If you get on the bad side of the party, your business uh, will fall on hard times. So everybody's uh, on the take in China and they take that corruption overseas. That's why we now have such a problem with the World Health Organization, uh, whose head, Dr. Tedros, who's not a medical doctor, by the way, he has a PhD in something, but not in medicine, but he's the head of the World Health Organization. He's a member of the ruling junta, the ruling group in Ethiopia, which is taking taken a lot of money from the Chinese Communist Party over the years. And he's basically been, you know, let's let's be honest about the fact that he's basically been bought and paid for by China. He was China's guy to head the World Health Organization. And so when China said to him in January, don't talk too much about the uh, epidemic uh, that we have in China, because don't worry, tell the world we've got it under control. And so the head of the World Organization lied on behalf of China and told the world, don't worry, Xi Jinping has everything under control, he's in charge, uh, this will not become a pandemic. He refused to declare it a pandemic until the end of February, almost two months later, uh, after he should have known that it was a danger, the China virus was a danger, not just to the Chinese people, but to the world. That's what happens when you let China's, uh, the Chinese Communist Party's corrupt practices, corrupt countries, and international agencies. Uh, people don't just suffer as a result of that. I mean, they're poor and less free as a result of this corruption. But now we see that you actually may die as a result of, uh, of the corru corruption practiced by the Communist Party. Uh, and that's a very different thing. Uh, we just had a Harris poll that said that 77% of Americans uh, believe that China is, is directly responsible uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic around the world. And it should be, quite frankly, 99% because there's no doubt that they are. Has China, like, have they used the coronavirus, I guess, as a geopolitical weapon? Like, have you seen them use the crisis that they created as a means to, I don't know, I guess, expand their power and influence? Yeah, let's, let's, let's think about what happened a little bit. What happened was China knew uh, in late December that it had an epidemic on, it, on its hands in Wuhan. On January 1st, it locked down the military bases in Wuhan, didn't tell the Chinese people anything, okay? In fact, the doctors who were trying to tell the Chinese people to warn them about the, the this new deadly virus uh, were actually silenced and forced to confess their crimes. Uh, but China, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, locked down the military bases because they didn't want the guys with the guns to get sick because, as Chairman Mao said, political power comes from the barrel of a gun. And they wanted to make sure that the guns were ready in case the epidemic in China caused an uprising. They hid the uprising from the world. On January 23rd, they locked down the city of Wuhan. They quarantined the city with about 15 million people in it and stopped all rail, road, and plane traffic from Wuhan to the rest of China. But get this, Marcus, they allowed planes to fly from Wuhan to other countries. So people from Wuhan were not able to fly from Wuhan to Beijing or Shanghai because Xi Jinping was afraid they might infect the good Chinese citizens of Wuhan and of Shanghai and Beijing. But they were a a allowed to fly to Tokyo, to Seoul, to Taipei, to Spokane, to, to Seattle, to Los Angeles, you know, all around the world. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? I cannot see any way to interpret that decision uh, other than to say that that the rulers of China knew they had a serious pandemic on their hands, uh, that they, they were going to have to shut down their economy for a period of time. But they decided they were not going to go down alone, that if they went down, the rest of the world was going to go down with them. And so they allowed the virus deliberately, in my view, allowed the virus to spread from Wuhan on these flights filled with people from Wuhan that went to places like Italy and Iran and Spain and Germany and the United States. And that's how we went from having an epidemic in China to having a pandemic uh, throughout the entire world. Now, beginning in early January, the Chinese also ordered its agents overseas to begin buying up personal protective equipment, face masks and the protective gowns. They ordered them to begin buying up ventilators and respirators. Why did they do that? Well, they knew they had an epidemic on their hands in China, but they also, I think, realized that this 
it was going to become a pandemic, and they wanted to have a lock on the world's supply of personal protective equipment. They cleaned out the personal protective equipment in many countries. They actually went through and ransacked Australia and shipped out all the personal protective equipment on special cargo planes that they sent to from, from China to Australia. And so when the epidemic began in Australia in earnest, because of these flights from Wuhan and other cities in China, the Australians looked around and said, wait a minute, where's our Where's, where did all of our personal protective equipment go? Our face mask. I mean, we were running out. And it turned out that weeks before, uh, Chinese agents had bought them all up and shipped them to China. I, I think that's another uh, something else we have to hold uh, the Chinese leadership accountable for. And then there's this. Uh, they've been going around the world and buying, in the last few weeks, distressed Western companies on the cheap. So you have a Western Airlines that has seen, had to ground all of its flights because it has no passengers. China, you know, snaps it up on the cheap for pennies on the dollar. British Steel, uh, two weeks ago, was sold to China at a fire sale price because the demand for steel had dropped to zero. So I think China is going out around the world and taking advantage of the depression, economic depression, that it itself has caused to buy things at fire sale prices, uh, again, seeking to profit from the pandemic that it itself caused. Uh, this is not the behavior of a, of a responsible uh, international player. It's not a, the behavior of a responsible member of the international community. Uh, we hoped uh, that China would become a responsible member of the international community uh, back in the 90s, uh, but that, that, that ship has sailed. Uh, that dream has died, and we now have to wake up to the reality of China as a predatory power uh, that causes problems around the world and then seeks to profit from them. I mean, it's it's really fascinating that I mean that you mentioned that they're buying you know British Steel, for example. Like I feel like over the last few weeks or so, that's been something that at least you know for myself, I've had conversations with friends about. Is this the concept that I feel like? And I don't know if this is an exaggeration or not, but I feel like they're just licking their chops at these opportunities in their mind. Opportunities. I mean, like you said, I mean, there's a global depression that they caused. There's all these companies, you know, in America and other you know Western countries, especially that are very in need of you know of a cash influx and i just feel like right now china in my opinion i just feel like they're completely benefiting off of this whole pandemic that they caused in my opinion i feel like there really hasn't been any kind of punitive talk from america like i feel like the obviously i mean you you don't want a you know war between america and china but on the same token, I feel like hardly anybody's actually like talking about the fact that China right now, I mean, I'm sure when this whole pandemic is said and done, like I live right outside of the Los Angeles area, I'm sure there's going to be a huge influx of Chinese investors buying property in LA, like they've done in the past, probably about 10 or so years ago. Um, I'm sure like you mentioned there's going to be all these companies that they're going to invest in and they're going to purchase. And I mean, although you didn't say this right now, I mean, uh, just in doing my own research for this interview and just, you know, just listening to stuff, you know, over the course for several years, you know, basically everything in China that has any kind of power in China is controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, any company that has money, they own the company essentially, or they have a major stake in it. And I mean, in your talk with the Heritage Foundation, I mean, you kind of mentioned that the Chinese system today, you know, some people think communist and they think, you know, the Soviet Union style, but really in reality, I mean, the kind of political power structure, I suppose, is more akin to something like a fascism. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, like, especially like you look at like the you know, Italian style with Mussolini. I mean, just the aspect of the government guiding the economy. And right. yes, yeah, so, I mean, when, when you see, you know, several billion dollars that are going to be poured into the Los Angeles area to buy homes, that's essentially the Chinese Communist Party buying those homes. Or like what you said, I mean, if, if there's a company like, um, I'm sure you've heard about AMC, already one of the biggest part owners of them already was a Chinese company, the Wanda Group. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. didn't even realize that the, the biggest, uh, like the biggest film suit or uh, biggest theater chain in America, was already owned by the Chinese. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I just feel like, I mean, is it that is that too big of a stretch to say that that China really is just looking at this horrible crisis that they created as an opportunity for themselves to grow? Yeah, it, it, they look at it as a buying opportunity, as an opportunity for the Chinese state. Uh, and the Chinese Communist Party senior members to enrich themselves. And of course, they, they, they shouldn't be allowed to enrich themselves at our expense at, at any time, but, but especially not now, uh, when they caused the, the economic, the global economic depression 
that they're now seeking to uh, to profit from. But back to your earlier point, I mean, Marcus, you're absolutely right. Uh, there, there really are no private companies in China of any size. Now, I'm not talking about the mom and pop store, okay? But, but the rule in China is that any company that has more than 50 employees must have a Communist Party cell among the employees of the company. That is to say, there must be a group of Communist Party members inside the company which watches over the company and makes sure that it does not stray from the party line. And there also must be, number two, there also must be a party secretary uh, appointed by the head of the company, by the CEO or chairman of the company, uh, to, to help guide the company in making executive decisions. And also that any company, any joint stock company, must have, must sell at least 1% of its shares, up to 10% of its shares, to the government so that the government can appoint a senior Communist Party member to sit on the board of directors of this company and monitor all of its decisions. Now, I, I think that most people will agree that if, if I own a company in China and I'm having a board meeting as the chairman and sitting across the table from me as a representative of the all-powerful Chinese Communist Party, and I say, I want to go in one direction, he says, no, Mr. Chairman, I think, I think that's a bad idea. Uh, I'm going to listen to him. Because if I don't, I may be the ex-chairman the following day, or I may be arrested for corruption, or they may simply confiscate my, my company. Half the companies in China, uh, uh, major companies in China, are owned by the state already. So they're state-owned enterprises, SOEs. Now, they're walking dinosaurs. Uh, they don't make money. They lose money. We estimate that the subsidies that the government, which is to say the party, has to pump into these dinosaurs, the, the walking dead, the zombie, zombie companies of China, is probably $4 trillion a year. Uh, that's one-third of China's GDP. That's a huge amount of money. But they like these state-owned enterprises because the party uses them to control the population. If you work for the state... Uh, you better do what the state says or you're going to be in trouble. And then you've got the private sector of the economy. We've already talked about that. There really is no private enterprise in China. Any enterprise of any, any size is indirectly controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. So that's the situation we find in China. So when you have Western companies competing against Chinese companies, it's not – a level playing field. Uh, if you go into China and try to do business, you're not competing with a company that makes uh, uh, a similar product to yours. You're competing with the Chinese Communist Party, which decides what the rules are and may change the rules if you're getting too big a market share or may steal your technology and then s squeeze you back out of the country. Uh, this is what, what we say in China is they don't have the rule of law. They have the rule by law. The rule of law means you put in place certain laws and everybody abides by them, even government officials. And the rule by law means that government officials set the rules and you'd better abide by them or you're going to get the midnight knock on the door. You're going to be arrested and charged with violating uh, the, the latest rule of the Chinese Communist Party. So this is this is the situation we find ourselves in with China. And so countries like the United States, Japan, Germany, Spain, France, Great Britain have to put in place rules that right now uh, and for some time to come that that Chinese state-owned companies or Chinese state-backed companies or China uh, uh, you know these these front companies that actually pretend to be private but are actually owned by the party the state uh, should not be allowed to buy uh, Western companies distressed Western companies we should help them out help those companies out we should not allow allow China to go around buying up companies at fire sale prices and profiting from the pandemic that they started. Now, the good news out of Japan is Japan is now paying Japanese companies to leave China. They are saying to Japanese companies, if you have a factory in China, we'll pay you to move your factory back to Japan or to move it anywhere. You can move it to the Philippines or Taiwan or India or, or the United States. Just leave China now. So Japan is doing that. We ought to do the same thing in the United States. Uh, we ought to tell companies that, that, uh, that want to leave China that you can deduct all your moving expenses from your taxes if you just leave China. Uh, this is what we've got to do as part of not the whole. Uh, this is not all of what we should do to punish China for the pandemic it's unleashed upon the world. But it's certainly one step. Uh, China cannot come out of this stronger and the United States and the rest of the world weaker. Well, I mean, I guess that leads to this next question. That's the idea that will China actually be punished for this? Because 
I, I mean, in my opinion, in my own, I guess, speculation is that I feel like China not only won't get punished for this, but I feel like they actually will get stronger from this. And I feel like the Chinese money that is just basically just like a drug to all these powerful multinational corporations and to governments all over the world. I just feel like China won't get punished at all from this. I mean, what do you think? Do you think do you think this is finally the wake up call where world leaders are going to say, you know, my gosh, like, you know, if this thing was as bad as we thought it was going to be, it could have killed billions of people. And maybe it's about time we actually stood up for ourselves and, you know, regained a little bit of our sense of, you know, nationhood and said, we're not going to let China bully us around like the way that they do in so many countries. And even in America, I mean, the fact that they own so many politicians in America is preposterous. I mean, do you think the international community is finally going to say, okay, there needs to be things that are going to change with China and there's going to be some form of punishment? Or do you think they're all basically just going to turn a blind eye and just say, oh, whatever, and then just get back to normal? Uh, I, I think there, there's a growing uh, collection of countries that will join with us in calling China to account for what has happened. And, and I think people in the world probably do realize that everybody who's gotten sick from the coronavirus, everybody who's had relatives die from the coronavirus, every company that's had to lay off workers because of the coronavirus, every company that's had to shut its doors, every small business that's gone under, everybody who's lost their life savings because of the, the Chinese virus, uh, they're all victims of the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, I, I have to think that, that actions are underway right now to forge a coalition of countries uh, that will call China to account. And it's not just preventing China from expanding its global reach at this moment and buying up companies, overseas companies, distressed companies at fire sale prices. It's a matter of allowing, for example, uh, American citizens to file a lawsuit against the uh, Chinese government uh, for the losses that it has suffered. So we'll waive China's sovereign immunity, which generally prevents us from filing lawsuits against foreign governments, waive China's sovereign immunity, and let every American, every American company, every American business that suffered from the China virus uh, sue the Chinese government, get judgments in American courts, and then, uh, and then uh, liquidate you know, Chinese state-owned property in the United States to pay for it. Uh, let's have all the countries of the world do that. Uh, let's have all the countries of the world join together and say, uh, you know, you own a lot of our debt, China. Uh, we're, we're going to not pay you that debt. We're going to take that as a down payment, as reparations for the damage that you've caused the economy. You know, it's not the absolute number of deaths. Well, thank goodness is a lot lower than the earliest estimates show. The earliest estimates came from Chinese false numbers, by the way. That's why those projections were so wrong. So this was something else that uh, China lied about and people died as a result. Uh, we would just weren't ready for the reality of the, the China virus. But um, it's not just the number of deaths or the number of people who fall ill. Uh, it, people are dying from other things. Uh, people who put off uh, needed uh, heart surgery or arthroscopic surgery or other medical procedures uh, may die as a result. Uh, suicide rates are way up in in not just the United States, but countries around the world. Uh, there are a lot of people dying from preventable diseases uh, that would not normally have died, but the medical resources in New Jersey and New York and the state of Washington, California, that would normally be used to, to, to deal with them, to cure their diseases, to take care of them, have been shifted into taking care of victims of the China virus. So there is a is a an opportunity cost for shifting all of our medical resources into dealing with one medical crisis, it means that other medical crises get neglected and people die as a result. So the body count of this is is much greater than we currently calculate, and the cost to the economy as well. That that has to this butcher's bill uh, has to be uh, sent to China, and, and China has to pay it in not just one way, but in many many ways. And you know, one one action by one country. Uh, wouldn't be enough to set China back on its heels. They might well come out stronger if it were just the United States. But I think a lot of countries are going to join together and take action against China, Japan, and, and the European countries foremost. And the Chinese economy will suffer a kind of death by a thousand cuts. And they will come out of this not stronger, uh, but weaker. And that's a good thing, uh, not just for the United States. It's a good thing for the world. I think people really might not understand the fact that China really is a totalitarian, you know, racist, anti-freedom, anti-human political structure. I mean, the things that they do, and I, I want to ask you this real quickly, too, is, I mean, even the stuff over the last couple of years that the Chinese have done, like if the, the media, again, this is a, it kind of goes back to the whole, you know, Chinese money in America, I mean, 
Chinese influence over media companies in America, at least large media companies, is so immense that there is virtually no outcry in America, or at least from the corporate media structure that we have, like the large institutions. They don't even talk about the crazy stuff that China's. I mean, yeah, they mentioned, you know, the Hong Kong protests, but I mean, some of the stuff that they've done, and maybe if you wouldn't mind elaborating on it, you know, the fact that the way that they treated Muslims in China over the last couple of years ago, or the last couple of years of the concentration camps, their abhorrent racism towards Africans in China yeah. that's going on right now, yeah. the fact that they tested nuclear weapons the other day, the fact that, I mean, would you mind maybe just going over just some of the human rights violations and just international treaty violations that China has committed over maybe, the, let's say, the last like two years? I mean, they start adding up and you just, you say to yourself, you're like, how is this not a country that, like every action that it seems like they've taken and at least that I, I've seen, and obviously you know far more than I do, it just seems like every action they've taken is almost, I don't know how else to describe it other than it's very aggressive and it sounds like they want something to happen. I mean, the fact that they're trying to buy up like all these companies while they're testing nuclear weapons, while they're denying the fact that like coronavirus came from them. There's just yeah. no end to it, Mark. Uh, and, you know, I know we've only got about 10 minutes left and we would need 10 hours to begin to, <laughs> to delve into the, uh, the long list of human rights abuses that occur in China under the misrule of the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, let me be clear, you know, I, I've been following this for a long time, that from human rights abuses against uh, Muslim uh, Uyghurs, Turkey-speaking Muslims in the far west of China, to the poor plight of the Tibetan people, uh, which should be, I mean, both of those should be an independent co independent country. They were independent countries before 1949 when, when Mao led the Red Army to uh, take control of those two parts of uh, what are now greater China. Um, but the list of human rights abuses is almost endless. You can name a human rights abuse, and China will almost certainly be one of the top offenders. So you mentioned you mentioned the the 10 million uh, Turkish speaking uh, Uyghurs in the western part of the country. What uh, we should call Western uh, Turkestan, what the Chinese government calls the new territory. Uh, why is it the new territory? Because it was only recently conquered uh, by a uh, Chairman Mao and the Red Army. Uh, in, in 1949, 1950. And several years ago, apparently President for Life Xi Jinping decided that he wanted to extinguish uh, the Uyghurs as a separate people. He wanted to do a kind of, of uh, cultural genocide on the Uyghur people, stamp out their culture, their religion, and even their very language. And in order to do that, he built concentration camps uh, throughout Western Turkestan, which hold anywhere between one and a half million uh, to three million uh, Uyghur men. And these are men between the ages of 20 and 50. Uh, these are men who are married and have small children, uh, who are the head of households. The very young and the very old have been left alone, uh, but the men have all been herded in concentration camps where they work all day long uh, producing textiles, which are often sold to the West and in the United States. It's illegal uh, to sell goods made by slave labor in the United States, has been since 1931 when the Soviet Union tried it, and we passed a law banning slave-made goods to come to the United States. Uh, because of uh, they put false labels on them, they transship them through other ports, they hide their origin. Uh, a lot of goods coming from China are made by slave labor. These Uyghur men who've been separated from their women and children. But the women and children are not left alone, Marcus. There's a huge police force that's been moved into Western Turkestan, and the police are billeted with the women and children left behind. That is to say, uh, a woman in her 20s with two or three small children will have a Chinese policeman come and knock on her door and say, I, you have been ordered to have me as a house guest for the foreseeable future. Now, when this was brought to the attention of the Chinese authorities, the Chinese authorities said, don't worry about this because yes, they sleep, the Chinese policemen sleep in the same bed with the women, but they're required to keep at least three feet between them and the woman. Now, if I were a, a Uyghur man in a concentration camp 10 miles away, and I heard that a Chinese policeman was sleeping in the same bed with my wife every night, but he was required to stay three feet away, I don't think I would be consoled uh, by that thought, would you? Uh, I don't think I'd find that thought very consoling. So that takes care of the men and the women. But what do you do with the teenagers? What they've done with the teenagers is they have sold them as slave labor to factories in other parts of China. I do not exaggerate, Marcus. They have advertisements that are posted online on Chinese websites by the communist authorities in 
Western Turkestan, which say, you, if you need factory workers, you can order them by the hundred from Western Turkestan. Uh, if you order them by the hundred, they will come with their own police minders, so you don't have to worry about security. They will come with their own cook, so you don't have to worry about cooking them the food they're used to. But if you order them by in batches of 100, you have to put them in a separate dormitory on the factory grounds and not let them leave the factory grounds except under escort. Um, and, and so we have slave labor now in China today where these teenagers, uh, boys and girls from 16 on to early 20s, taken and, and sold as slave labor to Chinese factories on the East Coast. Again, producing what? Producing goods for sale uh, in the world and in the United States. At the evening, after they've finished their 10 or 12 hour long shift, by the way, they have mandatory study sessions in Mandarin, the, the, the Han Chinese language. They're not allowed to speak their own language. Uh, their Turkish language, they're forced to speak. It's a violation of the rules for them to speak Turkish. So let me let me just stop there because I think that should clarify without talking about what's happening and the terrible things happening in Tibet, the terrible things happening to the Falun Gong, the Christians, the Buddhists, the Taoists, the Catholics, the political dissidents, the list goes on and on. We could spend all day on it. But just think about the poor Uyghurs. They're determined to extinguish these people as a separate people, and they're doing it, you know, they're on fast forward and doing this. In a generation, uh, they hope there are no Uyghurs left. They've torn down all of the mosques in Western Turkestan, except for a few they want to keep as, as um, you know, as historical monuments. They've, they've gone through, they've bulldozed all the graveyards, which contain the graves of the Uyghurs going back a thousand years. Uh, they're destroying the cultural memory of these people and seeking to brainwash them into being good, proper Han Chinese. It's 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 a it's a tragedy uh, and it's being ignored by the Western press. So I'll end on this by saying Bloomberg suppresses news about what's happening in China to the Uyghurs and, and what's happening in human rights because they make a lot of money in China. And they know that if they report on human rights abuses, they'll be sent packing. Uh, Forbes magazine, which once billed itself as a capitalist tool, is now owned uh, by a, a Chinese billionaire. And so it pulls its punches with regard to to China. Uh, the list goes on. Comcast has a major theme park. It's opening outside of Beijing. Invested a lot of money there. If you wonder why some of the national networks pull their punches uh, when it comes to China, they have investments there. They know that their investment won't produce a profit. They might be forced to leave China if they say things critical of the Chinese Communist Party. So if you do business in China, you're basically turning yourself into a hostage of the Chinese Communist Party. And that's not a position that American news organizations certainly should be in. But unfortunately, a lot of them are. Well, Steve, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Definitely. I appreciate your time. How can we keep up with your work and everything that you're doing and all the articles and everything? Well, let me let me tell you three things. One is, you know, we talked about my book, The Bully of Asia, and and it sort of encapsulates everything we've been talking about today. So that's a really, really good place if you've got an hour or two when you're sheltering a place uh, in home. At your home, uh, you can get it on Amazon, or you can get it from us at our website, pop.org, P-O-P dot O-R-G, where all of my articles are posted. POP is short for Population Research Institute. And, of course, I've been forced to open a Twitter account by Everything's Happening in China, and I am at Stephen W. Mosier, one word, at Stephen W. Mosier. But, uh, you know, if you read Bully of Asia, you will understand exactly where China is coming from and why China is the way it is. And I think right now, everybody needs to understand what we're dealing with in, in, in dealing with the bully of Asia. Jeez. All right, Steve. Well, thank you so much again for coming on and hopefully we'll be able to talk again sometime. We want to thank today's sponsors again, the Tax Defense Group and Rider Junkie. You can contact the Tax Defense Group at 800-850-7973. And Rider Junkie's phone number again was 